Hi, my name is Kyle. This is my friend Ross. And we're so excited to bring this simple and reproducing training to you so that you can make disciples of all nations. So you're going to need a partner and you're going to need some paper and a pen to practice. So we see in the Bible that Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus tells us, he says, that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he's commanded, and that he will be with us always until the end of the age. So we're going to give you some simple tools and some simple training to be able to do that where you are with anyone. Yeah. So what I want you to do, like Kyle mentioned, what you need is a sheet of paper, and this is going to represent your paper, and you need a buddy. Now, if you don't have a buddy, that's all right. You can practice with yourself. So this is the first thing I want you to do is take your sheet of paper, and I want you to write at the top, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to write it out here. It's going to take me a little bit. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. So if you can turn to your Bible in that passage, and I'm going to read that uh, here, and then we're going to make a few observations. So you're literally writing this at the top of your sheet of paper. And so I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. And I'm going to read that. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and look, the new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, this is good, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, there's a lot being said in that passage, but what I want you to focus in on, what I want you to do now is I want you to draw a cross right there in the middle of your sheet of paper. And that represents verse 21 where we see the exchange of our sin and Christ's righteousness. But what I want you to focus in is what comes as a result of that exchange. The first thing is I want you to draw an arrow going down just like this. And then I want you to draw a, a stick figure just like that, okay? And then I want you to put some sparkles around him just like he's bright, okay? This represents us as a new creation, okay? So that when, you, when this exchange happens, you become a new creation. Are they, keep going? All right. The other thing that happens to us because of this exchange, and this is really big, is I want you to make a circle right here, and then I want you to make a line, and then another line, and then just create something like this. And this represents the world. When this exchange happens, you become an ambassador and a new creation. An ambassador that's been entrusted with a message of reconciliation to go to your friends and family. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to explain to your buddy that in this passage, because of what Christ did for us, we have two new identities in Christ. We are a new creation and we are an ambassador. So just pause the video for a minute and practice this with your buddy, okay? Okay. Right. okay, now that we see that we have this new identity as a new creation and that we are ambassadors because of what Christ has done for us, we want to be ambassadors to the people that we know and that we love. So we see in the Bible many examples of this. We see about a man named Noah. God saved Noah and through Noah, he saved his whole family. God saved Abraham, and through Abraham, he saved his whole family. 
God saved a woman named Rahab, and through Ahab, a, through Rahab, saved all of her family. God saved a man named Cornelius, and through Cornelius saved all of his family. And God saved a woman named Lydia, and through Lydia saved her entire household. And so we see the example in the Bible that when God saves somebody, it's His intent, it's His purposes to use them to share the message with their entire family. So many of us have family members that don't know Jesus. Many of us have friends that don't know Jesus. So what we want to do now on our paper is that we want to make a list of those people that we know that do not know Jesus. Okay? So from 1 to 25, I want you to make a list of 25 people that you know that do not know Jesus. List those people out. And once you've listed those people out with your family, with your friends that you are there with, I want you to pray over those names. I want you to pray that God would save them. Pray that God would do something miraculous in their life to come to know Jesus. And once you've prayed over those names, I want you to circle five names that you want to share the story of God with in the next 24 hours. All right, we're going to jump back into this gospel tool, what you say when you go to your friend. We're going to practice this tool. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go back into this gospel tool and we're going to begin to work through it and you're going to practice this with your buddy. So if you remember, the first thing that you start out with, by the way, just if you want, all these stories are very common to a, a, a Muslim. They will know all these people. That's why we're using these stories. They're very common and they'll be able to relate to them. So the first story that Kyle told us is, is that first story is about Adam and, or Adam and Hiawa. They were in the garden. You remember that? And they were in an, a, a perfection. They were living with God in paradise with him. He gave them one instruction. Don't eat from the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. They disobeyed God, one act of disobedience, and they were separated from God, and shame came upon them. And the first thing that they tried to do to cover their shame is to sow fig leaves and cover their shame. That was not adequate. So God went and killed the first animal and took the animal skins and covered their nakedness and their shame. So what we see in this first story is God initiating something and covering their shame because they couldn't, all right? And then many years later, uh, the, the prophet Ibrahim was asked by God to go up on a mountain and sacrifice his son. So he, sure enough, he obeys. He goes there early in the morning, goes to the top of the mountain, and he builds an altar, and he places his son on the altar. But at the last second, the, uh, God comes and he says, stop, don't do that. And he provides a substitute in the son's place. He provides a ram so uh, Ibrahim doesn't have to sacrifice his own son. So in this example, we see God providing a substitute in the son's place. So what I want you to do right now, I want you to, and just say, I want you to practice what I just said. Shame, uh, a garden of Eden with Adam and Hiawa, and then Ibrahim and the sacrifice and God providing a substitute. What I want you to do right now with your buddy, or just pause the video, and I want you to practice these two uh, stories with your buddy or by yourself. All right, now we're back again, and we've practiced these two stories where God provides the covering for their shame, and then where God provides a substitute in, uh, uh, for His Son. Now, we're going to add two more stories to this. Now, many years later, we see the prophet Musa. He's in the land of, God, in the land of Egypt with God's people, and God's going to judge the land. And he says that um, he's going to uh, kill every firstborn son. 
But, but to avoid this judgment, he tells Musa to kill, uh, that every family that kills a male firstborn, or a male, a lamb, a spotless lamb, and takes the blood, and he takes the blood, and if you put the blood on the doorpost outside the home, you take that blood of that male lamb and you put it on the doorpost of that home. That when the death angel comes through the land, that, his, that God's judgment will pass over that home when he sees the blood on the doorpost. Very key. So what I want you to do right there is write the word blood right there. All right. When God sees the blood, his judgment passes over. And then the last story, many years later, uh, one of the last prophets, uh, his name is Yahya, or John the Baptist. When he sees Isa al-Masih, when he sees Isa al-Masih, he said, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So what I want you to do right here is I want you to write final lamb. Okay, so if, you, if you're tracking here, we've, we've done two stories right now. Shane, Adam and Hiawa, right? And then we have substitute. God provides a substitute. Now we've added two more stories, right? We've added that the blood, when God sees the blood, his judgment passes over. And we talk about Yahya, when he sees uh, Isa al Masih, he says that is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so what I want you to do right now is I want you to practice these two stories with your buddy or by yourself and placing Isa there in the center. All right, go for it. Okay, by now you've had two opportunities to practice. We're going to go through the story one more time and you're going to practice it from the beginning. Okay, so it starts out with the first people that God created, Adam and Hawa. They were in the garden with God, and they were in a perfect relationship with Him. But they disobeyed God, and they were naked, but they felt shame when they disobeyed God. And they tried to cover their shame with the leaves of the trees. But God said, that is not a good covering. So he did something very interesting. He killed the very first animal to cover their body, cover their shame with the animal skins. He covered their shame. Many years later came the prophet Ibrahim. God told Ibrahim to take his son and sacrifice him on the altar. Right before he was about to sacrifice his son, God provided the lamb in the place of his son. God provided a substitute. Many years later, after Ibrahim, there became a man named Moses. He was the leader of God's people at the time, and they were living in, G in Egypt. And God was going to bring judgment on the land of Egypt. But he told Musa that if you take a spotless male lamb and you kill the lamb and you put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of your home, my judgment will pass over your household. And so we see that it was the blood of the lamb that God saw and his judgment passed over the home. Many years after him came the prophet Yahya. Yahya, upon seeing Isa al-Masih, said, The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is calling Isa the Lamb of God, the final Lamb of God. And we know that Isa al-Masih was born of a virgin. He was pure. He came to this earth and he lived a perfect life. He never disobeyed God. And then he was killed. 
He was killed in our place. He died on our behalf for our disobedience to God. But on the third day, He rose from the dead. When He did that, He became the one who covers our shame. He is our substitute in our place. He, by His blood, we can avoid the judgment of God. And He is the final Lamb of God. So the question that you want to ask your family and your friends is, do you believe this message? And are you ready to follow Isa al-Masih so that you can have your shame covered, that God can be the substitute for you, that by the blood of Jesus you can be made pure, and trusting Him as your final Lamb of God and following Him, you can be welcome into paradise when you die. Now, turn to your neighbor or by yourself, pause the video, and I want you to practice this story until you can do it very well. Okay? Yeah, great. So now we've just given you a gospel tool, very simple, using these stories. So if someone says, yes, I want to follow and I want to receive Isa al Masih. This is the first thing you do. When you go back to them, you set up a meeting and you go back. What you want to do is you want to go and you want to open the Bible to Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. It's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And it's where he takes, uh, uh, where Philip takes him and he baptizes him. So what I want you to do with your buddy is I want you to turn to this and I want you to read it, okay? That's the first thing you do is you read it. And actually have them read it maybe, okay? So you read it once, okay? And then this is all you have to do is you just have to ask this question, okay? Just a very simple question. What are... the examples to follow in this story. It's just that simple. We're trying to make this a simple. So you go to Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40. We read it once, and then we ask your friend, whoever's received... And we ask them, what, from this story, what are the examples we are to follow from this story? All right? It's just that simple. It's the first thing you do with that person that wants to follow and receive. Okay, so hopefully from the story, they saw the example of the Ethiopian eunuch taking baptism. Okay? So that's what we want them to discover from that passage. So the right response to someone... For, for receiving Jesus is to be baptized. So we need to answer a couple of questions. Why should we be baptized? The answer from the Bible that we see is that because Jesus was baptized and he gave us the example. What is baptism? What is it? Baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol. It's like my wedding ring. When I put my wedding ring on, it's a symbol that I have decided to choose one woman out of the rest of the women in the world, and I put this ring on as a symbol to show people that I am married. And that's what baptism is. It's a, simple, it's a symbol. It's not an instrument. It doesn't do anything to you. It's only an act of obedience to show people that you have become a follower of Jesus. Okay? Who, who can baptize? Who can baptize? Well, we see from the examples in Scripture, the people that baptize are believers. Believers who have already decided to follow Jesus. And the other question is, who is baptized? Who is baptized? The people that are baptized are the people that follow 
Jesus. The people that have made a decision to become a follower of Jesus. Okay? So there's a simple lesson of why do we baptize? It's because Jesus was baptized and he commands us to be baptized. What is baptism? It's only a symbol. It doesn't do anything to you. It doesn't save you. It's an act of obedience as a symbol for us deciding to make Jesus our King, make Jesus our Lord. Who can baptize? Any believer can baptize. Who is baptized? A believer. Someone who's made a decision to follow Jesus. Okay, so now that we know what baptism is, we need to learn how do we baptize. So the best way to do it is to find a body of water. It could be a lake, it could be an ocean, it could be your bathtub. Find whatever works in your context. And so the way that you baptize is you take the person who's decided to follow Jesus and you want to ask them three questions. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead? Are you making him the Lord and King of your life? And are you willing to follow him no matter what? And so when they say yes to these things, and they are ready to take baptism, what I want you to do is help them plug their nose and grab their arm. And I want you to put them in the water, ask them those questions. Ross, do you believe that Jesus died for you, yes. for your sins and rose from the dead? I do. Are you making him the king and Lord of your life? Yes, I am. Are you going to follow him no matter what? Yes. Then, brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so I take him down into the water and I bring him back up. It's just that simple. All right. So now that we've learned to baptize and learn what baptism is for new followers of Jesus, we want to know what do we do for discipleship? How do we help people grow in their relationship with Jesus as an individual and as a community? So what we're going to show you now is a simple way to meet with people, meet together, to be able to grow into your relationship with Jesus. So as you gather with people, as you gather with your family, the first thing that you want to do is that you want to care for them by asking them, how are you doing? What is something that we can uh, praise God for? And what's something that we need to pray about? What's something that stressed you out this week? What's something that you are thankful for? So we want to discuss that and we want to pray for each other. The next thing that we want to do is we want to celebrate our obedience to God. Because when we hear from God's word and we apply it and we obey God in our life, that's how he begins to work in us. Now, we don't obey God to earn his love, but we obey God out of his love for us. He has already done everything for us. Okay, so we don't have to earn anything from him. He, obey he loves us perfectly. But we want to celebrate our obedience because he wants to work in our lives and we receive joy when we obey him. Okay, so we want to talk about that because we're going to set goals at the end of every meeting to apply what we learn from God and how we are sharing the gospel with our families. So we're going to celebrate that every week. Okay, so as we care for our, our family and our friends and our gatherings, as we celebrate our obedience to God, we now come to a new lesson. Now, there's seven lessons in short-term discipleship. This is the first lesson, okay? This is the first lesson that we see uh, in Mark 1.15. We see a command that Jesus gives us, and I'm going to go ahead and read that in Mark 1.15. So in your groups, as you guys gather, you want to go to this passage and you want to read it. And it's very simple. It says, the time is fulfilled, this is Jesus speaking, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So we see very clearly from that passage that the command that Jesus gives us is to repent and believe. Now we want to look at a story where somebody does that. So we're going to turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke. Okay, we're going to look at the book of Luke. All right, that's just to the right of the book of Mark. And we're going to look at chapter 19, 
verses 1 through 10, and we're going to read this story. When you do this as a group, what I want you to do, I want you to read the story twice, okay, or someone tell the story twice, and I want you to retell the story so that you guys all have it memorized. So this is the story. I'm going to read it out loud for us. Now, he entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I must stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who sat began to complain. He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor Lord. And if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I will pay back four times as much. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So when we read the story and we read it twice and we close our Bibles and we retell it so that we all understand it and know it and all the details, we want to open the Bible and look back at the story and we want to answer some simple questions from the Bible. This is a simple method that we call the sword. Okay? The Bible says that the Word of God is like a sword. And so this helps us ask the right questions from the Bible. We want to make sure we get our answers from the Bible and not from anybody else, anybody else's opinion. We want to make sure they come straight from the passage that we just read. The first question that we want to ask is, what do we learn about God from this passage? What do we learn about Jesus? What do we learn about the Holy Spirit? Are there anything, is there anything in this passage that we see? And so again, we want to make sure that we get, the, we want to get our answers from the Bible. And we want to make sure that we read from the passage where we see our observations. Okay. The next thing that we want to ask is, what do we learn about the people in the story? What do we learn about the man and the woman? Okay, what do we learn about the people in the story? So again, we want to make our observations from the Bible. Okay, if observations are made that are not from the Bible, we want to say, I don't see that in there. Okay, so make sure you say what verse you got your observation from. The next question is, is there a command in the Bible? Is there a command in the story that we should obey? And certainly there is, right? We saw the first command that Jesus gave, and that was to repent and believe, right? And so we see a command in this story, and I'll let you find it, okay? And we also want to see what is the example to follow? Is there something that somebody does in this story that we should also do? Is there an example that we should follow? And make your observations again from the Bible, right? From this passage. And the last thing that we want to do is that we want to set a goal to obey. What is God telling us? So after we've read the story, we've asked the questions, we want to ask God, God, what do you want me to do in response to this story? So you can take a few minutes and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is it exactly He wants you to do. And so that's why it says at the bottom, I will. Okay, I will. Anytime we come to the Word of God, our right response is to obey it. Okay, so when God tells us what to do, maybe it's helpful that we tell some people around us, God has told me to do this. And it may be helpful to also write it down. Okay, so this moves us into our next part. So as we've come to the Word of God, what is God telling me to do? What is God telling me to do from this story? And I also want to set a goal. Who needs to hear the gospel this week? Or who needs to hear this story 
and that we learned from the Bible. So you can set a goal to share the gospel with somebody on your list that you wrote down earlier, or you could share this story with somebody on your list that hopefully gets you to share the gospel message. Once you have done that and set those goals, you want to pray and ask God to give you the courage and give you the boldness to do what He's told you to do. Because next week, when we meet again, we're going to ask each other, how did it go? How did it go obeying Jesus and what He told you to do? And we want to celebrate that because when we obey Jesus, we feel His joy and we begin to grow into His likeness. So what we've given you is a simple pattern to meet. When you meet, this is what you do together. You care for each other. You celebrate obedience. You learn from the Word of God. You apply it to your life and you set goals to share it with others. And then we pray. All right? So this is what you're going to do with your family and with new believers and with believers as you begin to gather as a community of people that are following Jesus together. So just like I said, there's seven stories that we're going to give you. This is the first story. This is the first command, and the command is to repent and believe.